Molo San Bonani, hello, how's it? Welcome to the episode of the Big Daddy Liberty Show. Oh my goodness, it has been a while since I've joined you guys on um, air. Oh my goodness, like it's just one of those terrible, terrible situations of having a poor internet connection. Speaking about poor internet connection, let me perhaps apologize in advance. This... Um, this interview might be a little patchy because of clear network issues, but um, today's conversation is actually a rather important one. I'm going to be chatting to two guys who I think um, are prob probably some of the most prominent voices when it comes to issues of all things economic, social issues, and of course, um, political issues through the lens of liberty and freedom. And that is a conversation which is super important right now, given that right now, as you're listening to me, you're probably sitting in your home, effectively under some form of quasi-house arrest, i.e. the lockdown, as the politicians have touted it. Guys, remember, you can support the work of your favorite fat boy, Big Daddy Liberty, by becoming a friend of the IRR. That is our crowdfunding campaign. How do you do that, you're wondering? Well, SMS your name to 328 two three uh an sms will cost you one grand terms and conditions apply someone will give you a call and sign you up or hey if you're tech savvy as we now all are thanks to this uh, lockdown um, find us online at irr.org.za and you can sign up a monthly debit order of 90 rand just 90 rand there okay without much um ado i am joined of course for this um uh, discussion by uh, Russell Lamberti, uh, prominent uh, uh, economist in the country and really, as I said, one of the voices you guys really should be paying attention to. And of course, uh, Mpia Kekigamini, a regular that you might be uh, quite accustomed to on my other show, Blacks Only. Fellas, let me not get into too much waffling and just say hello, hello. How are you guys doing? Hello, Sitle. Yeah, it's been a long time, but it's great to chat to you again. Hey, man, good to be back. Russell, yeah, how are you, buddy? To, yeah, uh, good to be with you, man. Really good to be with both of you. It's uh, it's three KZN boys in the house. Damn straight, man. Damn straight. <laughs> oh, um, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Guys, you know what? I'm, I'm really going to jump straight into this one because the, the conversation, as we've seen it in, in the traditional media, has been absolutely asinine and has missed some of these major issues uh, related to the lockdown. So, um, Biak, I'm going to begin with you because we, we talk a lot about these issues on uh, Blacks Only and the other shows that we've, we've been on. The idea that in a free society, um, certain freedoms make up um, a functional um, uh, prosperous property earning society and a lot of these relate to of course certain freedoms uh, as I was mentioning sorry um, that the individual enjoys this lockdown has really placed a dampener and a restriction on a lot of our freedoms what am I referring to here Biak? Yes, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think all the all the uh, freedoms that we have you know all our, our human rights have been violated during this lockdown if you just look at it uh, it, it ranges from cops killing people so basically, the right to life doesn't matter anymore because, you know, we have to protect everyone from the virus uh, to cops violating property rights. Like the, I saw a video where the police jumped over a fence into someone's home because the person was uh, basically saying some bad things to the police. And so, like, you know, things, things like that. And then this is also uh, influenced, like, you know, your freedom of action into how you can um, use the, the, that property and that life that you have. So you people have uh, have been stopped from earning a living, for example. Informal traders especially can't really trade because, you know, government is trying to uh, force them to trade under the conditions that they, they were trying to get them to trade under before the lockdown, which is why they, it's informal in the first place because you, you can't comply with the regulations, so you become an informal trader, but then government tries to force you because it's a national crisis or whatever to to so basically the people who couldn't get jobs before and went into the informal trade and uh, survived using the informal trade but now they can't trade because now the cops are everywhere and you still need those regulations to comply with the regulations basically the permits so it's it, it's uh, it's terrible all around and some of these regulations if i can call them that basically the whims of ministers who at the direction of the president, of course, there's been a, a national declaration of, uh, not disaster, um, uh, yeah, I'm right, a national declare, declaration of disaster. Essentially, there's been a suspension of some of the checks and balances that ordinarily go into uh, keeping political power uh, to account. 
right now, as we speak, th- there's a big wrangle with the trade and industry minister, Ibrahim Patel, basically with some legal minds, Richard Spoer being the most prominent, I, I think, online, basically saying, hey, a lot of these uh, announcements... Question, was it directed to me? Uh, yeah, yeah, just uh, uh, to you, and then I'll, I'll go to Russell, because I'm really trying to set up the idea yeah. that what we've basically seen is politicians take on more powers for themselves in an unchecked fashion. And yeah. I was using Ibrahim Patel, the trade and industry minister, as a good example right now. I mean, you can also use Begit yeah. um, Tele, who basically says, yes. hey, uh, amongst some of the other regulations and in inverted commas that we're putting in place is no um, individual, no company can sell prepared food. There's a, a, a war on roast yeah. chicken, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it seems like it's all, a lot of these regulations are ridiculous. Even if you buy into the public health uh, explanation for the lockdown itself, a lot of these regulations don't make any sense at all. I mean, I've I've been getting cooked food from a garage, and I suppose I won't be getting it anymore because the government has decided that it's going to increase my risk of getting the COVID-19. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, they are busy sharing the facts just on the base or just on the data on, on the health uh, consequences like they are busy sharing the fact that, uh, that because of the lockdown uh, cases uh, were much less than predicted much less than even they predicted with the lockdown in their models mm. which means the models are wrong and so now because uh, but, but during that time we had most places had cooked chicken like you know you cooked uh, cooked food rather so we, we we had cooked food during that entire time and we still had this massive drop in expected cases so why would you keep that regulation it doesn't make any sense absolutely russell I'm, i must bring you in here because i think it's a perfect segue the idea of you know rational action are we seeing a again with the state having appropriated the power for itself uh, that being a separate issue but the state having done that are we seeing them do it on the basis of rac- rational action or basically are we seeing a cohort of power hungry politicians making decisions at a whim yeah so i think i think we we are definitely seeing amongst some of the anc politicians here a power grab i think the what france cronier would would call the securocrats the the begitele uh, uh, sort of state capture a smagashule kind of grouping of the ANC and um, they sort of are in control of the security cluster, the police, the military, the intelligence. They're obviously seeing this as a tremendous opportunity to up their influence uh, within the within the party and to and to up their, their, their overall power. Um, and then you've got the socialists who at the moment uh, are, are spearheaded by Ibrahim Patel. So these socialists are being supported by a group of so-called 76 economists who signed a document uh, that basically called for far more socialist intervention in the economy, uh, spearheaded by a lot of the Witz um, kind of socialist Marxist um, uh, thinkers. Mm. Um, and so this is very much part of the playbook um, amongst uh, in the ANC at the moment. No, I'd agree. I'd agree. And I think the evidence is beginning to point to that. And you now have a situation where even ordinary South Africans, people who ordinarily wouldn't question uh, the decision making of their politicians, mostly because it may be their favorite politicians, right, who are beginning to say, but some of these regulations don't make sense. Um, some of these regulations don't speak to yeah. the stated goal of dealing with the, the coronavirus. It, it seems as though you're basically conditioning society for something else i mean i can go into two examples before we, we move on to the, this issue but i can make two examples here the state has basically now introduced a regulation that is able to track uh the data on people's phones again the guys is under this emergency provision of oh if someone spreads fake news um we ought to be able to find that individual but as i made mention at the beginning of this crisis once a government once a politician introduces a a a regulation that gives them power, accords them a certain power, under the name of it being temporary, don't expect it to actually be temporary. Like, There's nothing as permanent, as Milton Friedman says, as a temporary government program. Talk to me about this, Russell, because I think someone who might be listening is thinking, oh, there we go now, these three libertarians. Um, of course, they'll talk about you know, the state um, you know, appropriating powers, but there's nothing wrong with that, as the lefty would say. We, we need our politicians to have this sort of power. Cyril is our savior. How am I wrong, Russell? <laughs> well, Sita, you know, it's interesting. So we expect that to come from the far left to, to 
to cheerlead uh, more state control. But what's really interesting this time around is that um, the, 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 the corners of civil society that we normally expect to be very alert to this kind of uh, power have completely missed it. Um, they've been very asleep at the wheel. Uh, and I think that's that's quite telling and that's quite interesting. Um, not everyone, certainly not the Institute of Race Relations, um, and, and certainly not a group, for example, like Saka Liche, oh, uh, headed yeah. by Pete Leroux, who's, mm. doing who's doing incredible work. Um, but so many people who historically, and I'm talking about journalists, I'm talking about big business, I'm talking about other corners of civil society, have just missed one of the most obvious um, state power grabs that we've seen in, in post-94 South Africa. And I think that um, we can't be vigilant enough here, Sitle. We, you know, people will, will say we're crying wolf and that we're, we're uh, you know, we, we, there's, there's a red under every bed, you know, type, type thing. This is the Roy Gefar. But I think, I think we, really, we really need to be extremely vigilant here because for every hundred units of power that government has taken in this crisis, they may only give us back 70 or 80. And we might thank them for it at the end, but they've actually taken 20, 30, 40 units of, of additional power. Absolutely. And um, I, I think that's that's something we've got to take very seriously. Absolutely. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, okay, I'm going to come back to you because I think U Russell sets out a very important um, idea here. The idea that vigilance, number one, is key. But there's also a situation where I, I'm, I'm going to let me broaden the conversation just for a moment. Uh, South Africa is not the only country, of course, that's embarked on this one size fits all type lockdown. This idea that you lock everything down, even though there's no necessarily underlying plan to sort of justify the one size fits all lockdown. Sorry, that was a, a mouthful. But the point I'm trying to make is you, you're seeing similar despotic behavior. Uh, you're seeing similar abusive state esque securocrats, if you will, behavior in other countries. America, for example, the supposed land of the free. I mean, I shared a video this morning. Um, yeah, I'm right, this morning, of a, a city in, in California where they're bulldozing sand, um, or rather they, they're pushing sand into a skate park of all places. Um, people are being arrested on the beach for going surfing. Um, you know, you, you can name it. Because the, the, a lot of people think it's just happening in South Africa because we've been sharing videos of like the army brutalizing mostly poorer black individuals in townships. But it's it's around the world, isn't it, Timpiak? Yeah, it is. And that's, uh, that, that's the worrying thing for me because, you know, <laughs> just to tell you a little bit of a funny story, I was interacting with the, uh, the MP on Twitter and I was I kept asking him what what like since they supported the lockdown like what what evidence did they see that we have been seen like what what was the justification given by government and basically his answer was well uh, the the Europe is doing it and uh, America is doing it so <laughs> so that that kind of thinking really worries me and because we've also started hearing rhetoric about a, a new normal mm -hmm. and things will never be the same that kind of rhetoric seeping into and you can see, like, I, I just think what what Russ is saying is very important about mm. vigilance, because now, like, you know, it, the fact that they keep saying these things are, is a big red flag to me that we probably won't be getting uh, uh, some of our freedoms back after this. And, you know, like, it, it's it's just a convenient, a convenient excuse for them to take more of them away. Mm. And the place like America is actually uh, better off than we are because of their federal nature. So the states are, are, are have more or less restrictions depending on the states and the mm. and the people. So they they at least they have that. I, I I wish we had that here because you would have probably have the Western Cape implementing the regulations differently. Knowing the people who run them, there would still be uh, heavy restrictions, but there would be there would be some freedoms I would think because they would they would choose the rational evidence based approach. But so like I uh, we uh, I think uh, places like which are more decentralized like the USA are better off actually. Uh, uh I must bring this in because, again, Russell brought it up for a moment, but it's been disappointing and rather ominous to see people who uh, ordinarily, if things worked as they were supposed to, I suppose, which is a weird thing to say, but anyway, um, you, you've seen a, a gaggle of individuals who hold a lot of social power, um, basically taking the side of the state in the removal of other people's rights or in the... Um, almost in, in, it almost feels like 1940s Germany to an extent. I mean, we had a situation earlier on where journalists themselves were taking the position of reporting people, for example, for jogging um, 
to the state. I mean, right now I'm looking at a tweet by a one councillor, Tim, a DA councillor here in Johannesburg, who's basically snitching on people enjoying coffee, takeaway coffee, mind you, outside Forno's uh, in Dunkelt. I mean, what's happening here? Do we have a society that just maybe doesn't understand the importance of liberty, doesn't understand the importance of personal freedoms, even during a time, yes. time of crisis? No, I, I, I say that the answer to that is 100% yes. I think South Africans really don't, like it, even the people who, who, are, who currently identify as liberals now, they really don't care about freedom as much as they care about, well, things working well. Mm. So that, that's, 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 that's what they care about. They want, they, they want good services from government. They, don't, they, they, they want uh, the welfare state, really. They want, they want government to have uh, a strong control over the economy and everyone else and to basically decide for people and make good decisions on behalf of people. So they don't trust uh, individuals, they don't trust uh, themselves and m most likely other people to make the right decisions. And so you see this in South Africa where people have just turned each other on a dime. And in fact, like it's quite it's quite interesting to see that the, the places that tend to support the ANC are the, are the least likely to snitch on their neighbours and to and to support the ANC socialist program basically during this lockdown and the places that have uh, have, have had have been the strongest opposition to the ANC over the years those are the places where you see people snitching on each other and where the police don't even, the army and the, the army and police don't even bother patrolling mm. because they know that people will enforce will enforce these things this thing on their own no i think i think you guys have, have hit on something really important and the lesson here is is how easy it is to create a society of snitches um, when you're <laughs> able to convince them. Yeah, w w when you're able to convince them that there's a uh, a big sort of uh, common um, threat that can only be dealt with socialistically. Um, that, that was precisely how communist countries were able to have a snitching society. This is actually this is actually precisely how tyranny works, guys. It's no there's no other way for tyranny to work other than mass participation by the by the population. Mm. Um, and if you go to 1940s Germany, if you go to 1950s uh, or 1930s uh, Soviet Russia, if you go to 1970s or 60s communist China, you have millions and millions of people helping the state enforce its tyranny. Um, and so this is an incredibly important issue. Now, you know, this is going to go away in, to a large degree. The virus is going to blow over. We're going to start to realize how severe it is or isn't, and we're going to sort of get back to some degree of normal life. I don't think we're about to go into a Maoist, um, you know, hellscape, but um, we're getting a glimpse into how tyranny advances. Um, and, and if you can convince enough people that the government has the right to centralize these decisions and to tell everyone what to do at every minute of the day, you are on the way to a very, very problematic uh, political situation. Mm -hmm. no, I agree. And I, I think it, it segues quite nicely then to really the next point I wanted to look at, which is we're being primed for something here. Um, all the hallmarks prior to this um, crisis, if I can call it that, of COVID, had already indicated that the ANC were looking to centralise power and essentially become more of a player in what really should be the space of individuals in the private sector, really, uh, on various issues such as healthcare, property rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It does seem as though that we're being positioned to sort of praise and worship certain politicians who then, maybe after the COVID uh, uh spell, if I can call it that, um, will then smoothly be able to say, well, remember how I dealt with COVID? How about you now give me control of the entire healthcare system through something like the National Health Insurance? Russell, I'm going to come back to you on this one. The 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 telltale signs have always been there, that there is a, a move towards what you call, um, I'm going to use your expression here, of technocratic socialism, the idea that the state centralizes everything because it has all the quote-unquote experts. And these experts were paraded in front of us uh, and had, it had the med middle class gushing over them, for example, Professor Kareem, and we then forget to ask serious questions around how that society, what that society looks like and whether it's really preferable. Are we being primed for something bigger here? I think we certainly could be. I, I think that that risk is very much on the table. 
Um, there are murmurings coming out of the healthcare sector that the, the Minister of Health does indeed want to transition our system into even more of a, of a socialistic healthcare direction and using this crisis um, for that. I think that's a, it's a very, very eminent threat that we face and we've got to uh, resist that you know, s severely and significantly. Um, yeah, so so I think that that from all directions we are seeing this. I just want to make this point, see clear. Um, I think I think what a lot of people don't realize with this is is the principle that you concede when you allow governments to centralize these incredibly complex decisions. Risk management is at such scale is highly complex, and what you want is smart, agile decision making. At a at a devolved level, as a, you know, at a, at a community level, at a household level, at an individual level, you want to you want to push those decisions all the way down. You know, a lockdown for someone who lives in a nice big house in Constantia is very 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 different from a lockdown for someone who lives in a shack in uh, in Kailicha. Mm. Um, and 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 to to pretend that that we can have a one size fits all policy is to concede to totalitarianism. Mm. It's to concede the principle of totalitarianism. Um, and and I really, you know, you asked earlier, is it that people don't understand a huge issue? We've seen journalists, um, for example, trying to rat out uh, Allworths for, for cooking chicken and so on. These are the same people who were cheering in 1994. And you, you have to ask yourself, what were they cheering for in 1994 if they so if their understanding of liberty is so deficient, what was it that got them so excited in 94? If they're willing to rat out a company for selling food mm. to, to fellow human beings. And invariably, mostly the sort of poorer segments who maybe don't have the sort of means to be able to cook every single day, um, given the sort of quote unquote essential jobs that they do in the long hours they work. Um, Beck, I want to come back to you because again, and you, you might be able to pick up the exasperation in my voice because you know it, it does seem as though as, as I put it to Russell, we're being primed for something here. There's something it's obviously not being said overtly, um, but you have a middle class in this country who's who's clapping on politicians taking more and more powers because invariably I think there's also an air of middle class individuals, both black and white, by the way, who go, well, you know, none of this affects me. Um, as Russell said, I live in Constantia, or I live in um, Belleville, and, you know, we've got a nice little yard. Um, and, hey, on a day-to-day -day basis, under these lockdown conditions, I don't see any soldiers. I'm able to go to Woolies down the road, and it's fully stocked. But for the poor individual, and the videos we've been sharing like, online, I mean, I shared that one video of the chap who... You could see he went to maybe buy some bread and Coca-Cola. You could see that in his hands. And then rushes in from stage left, this uh, military ambulance, and these soldiers jump out, and they beat the living hell out of this guy. And once they're done and he's writhing on the ground, they just get in their cars and they leave. There's a, there's a certain psyche developing in our poorer communities. Um, what, one more example, in Mitchell's Plain, for example, last week, they took to the streets, um, effectively in a mini riot, to say, guys, we can't... This is untenable for us. Um, it might be okay for you middle-class people, but it's not for us. Uh, what, what are we likely going to see, Ampia? And I'm sorry, I know I'm asking you to forecast, but give me your best impression of what might happen here. Well, I think, I think first of all, I think a lot of um, uh, middle class people are suffering from this because, you know, if you remember, a lot of them are business owners, small business owners, and so business cash flows are being massacred right now. A lot of them own, like, franchises, restaurants, mm -hmm. a, lot of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of us go to work and so a lot of people can't work there right now and they've had to take pay cuts and things. And uh, I, I know that I almost probably have to take a pay cut this month. So it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's hitting people. But I think because uh, there's sort of a, a fate in government. I don't know, I don't know where, this, where the middle class gets this fate in government. That government will somehow make them whole at the end. Mbiak is absolutely right. There's this weird insistence by middle class individuals that somehow, you know, the state will, will, will make us right. Um, Mbiak, I, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but we, we've actually completely lost you. Russell, I don't know if you're on the line. Um, but Mpiaki raised an, an important point, this idea that, you know, there's this weird faith that somehow the money is going to fall from the sky um, after this and everybody's going to be patched up. But why is this fallacious as we really move into the economic aspect of, of this entire thing, uh, Russell? 
Okay, I've also lost Russell. Okay, while I try and establish this connection again, I think it really is important, uh, you know, to to sort of remind ourselves that you know there, there's this weird, there's this weird insistence on on suggesting that somehow you know the state is going to be able to provide or the state is going to uh, make everybody right again, and I'm not sure this is based on evidence. I mean, Russell made mention of the this group of academics who've basically been pressuring government to institute a basic income grant um, with some of them you know suggesting that for example other social grants like the child uh, care grant needs to be bumped up by 500 rand um, over this period or over the next three months but the, the question really remains what happens in an economy when you begin to start pumping money out like that because invariably the state has to get it from one of two sources either a it has to uh, borrow that money, um, or B, it has to tax people more. I think I have the guys back on here. Uh, guys, I was just talking through this while I was trying to reestablish both of you back on the line. Russell, I, I'm gonna, I, I went back to you. BIK, I know we, um, I don't know if you're on here again, BIK, yeah. Um, guys, I was just setting out very briefly that the, 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 there's this, picking up on what BIK is saying, this, this weird belief by the middle class and basically others too, that we can live off of other people and the state can provide for everybody, that there's certain fundamentals economically we're forgetting, that money doesn't fall out from the sky, but there is this expectation that we're just going to pay everybody. Um, uh, Russells, I'm going to come back to you because you made the point. This group of academics who've been goading the state to provide things like a basic income grant uh, or to bump up temporarily um, you know, the child support grant. Like As I was asking on air now, where do you get the money for this? Because there's only one of two sources for the state. Either they borrow that money or um, essentially they tax South Africans more. But I just don't see how those two options are available. Russ? We are seeing calls for mass stimulus. And the thing is, is that money doesn't grow on trees, as we know. <laughs> uh, when you talk about, when you talk about um, bailouts and stimulus, it comes from somewhere. It, it, it takes real wealth and real savings and it distributes it around the economic system. That can work, right? When you have 99.9% of your okay and a very small portion of it gets into distress and, and you could make that decision that you want to bail that portion out, perhaps because it was a very unlucky type of distress that it got into. And that could be a legitimate um, discussion to be had. But the point really is that you would have ample resources to to fund that. Okay, In this situation, we've got a, we've got a, a, a situation where um, almost everyone is now under huge strain. Everyone can't bail everyone else out. <laughs> That's an impossibility. Mm. Um, and I think it was I think it was Bastiat who said that the, the government is the great fiction where everyone expects to live off the expense of, of everyone else, um, or the state is the great fiction. And and so what you what you, the, the calls for for bailouts, for corporate bailouts, for household bailouts, for for income grants, and all these things, where are they going to come from? I'll tell you where they're going to come from. They're going to come from the last remaining um, pockets of wealth and savings in South African society. And so as you try and transfer that across to, to consumption, you're essentially diminishing your wealth production potential. And so you might, in the very short term, be able to tide some people over and give them meals and, and give them a little bit of income to tide them over. Mm. But in the big scheme of things, actually destroying wealth. I, I agree. And, I, you know, you have a character like Magnus Haystack, um, very prominent and loud voice on social media, a guy who I really encourage everybody to follow, who raised another specter, you know, the idea that South African debt is sitting on 4.2 trillion rand right now. Like, where is this money going to come from? I mean, you're already seeing other grant yeah, exactly. dependents. Good for, point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for, I was about to say, you're already seeing other grant dependents uh, who've been chronic grant dependents like SAA, I'm talking about the state-owned enterprises, not individuals per se, um, who are beginning to start seem to see, you know, government give them bat because they, I think there is a, a, a slight, almost tacit re realisation, even amongst the hardened ideologues in government, that the money is just not there. And I think Tito Mboeni is probably someone who's driving that narrative in cabinet, Russ? Cecilia, you, you, you know where the money should come from, M morally speaking. It should come from everyone who's who's involved in creating 
the problem in the first place. Mm. Um, now, the virus, the virus is not something we could control, but the lockdown certainly is. And if the government wants to lock down, the government must give up hundreds of billions of rands of its own salaries mm. and income, um, and it must hand it over to the private sector. That is real skin in the game mm. on policy. Uh, th and that is where there is funds, right? There is still some funding going through to the government. So the government must make a choice. If they want to close down society and, and massacre people's income, as, as Mpiaki said, which is absolutely correct, um, they should be cutting the state payroll by hundreds of thousands of employees. They should be cutting the procurement bill to all the tenderpreneurs and, and all, the, all, all the patronage network by hundreds of billions of rands. Um, they're not willing to do that at all. Instead, there's talk of money printing and of more borrowing. Who's going to shoulder that those that debt? It's the taxpayer who mm. is the one who is in trouble in the first place. Mm. So, so more borrowing and more printing is absolutely the wrong direction to be going in. The way to stimulate things from now is to is for government to have a recession. We need a government recession, and we need lockdown to end, mm. and we need sensible risk management policies. That is the best stimulus we could have as an economy. Well, I fully agree. Yeah, okay, I want to come to you because I think U U Russell has set it out quite in, in clear terms. The idea that it, it can't be, can no longer be the individual, the, the families in this country who are the ones who are paying the economic price uh, for bad policy decisions. We've got to eliminate the moral hazard, shouldn't we? of politicians and state officials making bad decisions and never paying for them themselves directly. Um, yeah, okay? yeah, no, I agree with you. And uh, I, I think like the, the simple answer there is just to have government live within its means, like, you know, to cut taxes in order to provide the needed stimulus to the economy, but also cut spending in order to live within its means. And I think that that's also requires t t telling everyone else in the, who is involved in the economy, poor people also, that they also have to uh, uh, find work and government will get out of their way in doing that so that they can actually find work and then they, they can't expect to be funded uh, whether it's education or health or, or grants or anything like that. The government just gets out of their way in finding work or, or, or creating income for themselves and then uh, including the, the regulating businesses so that small business can form. And so, uh, and then uh, and this, this is a hard decision politically, but I think it needs to be done because if there's if 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 there's no time if there's if ever there was a time to tell to teach people that everyone has to learn how to live within what they can produce and save, if if if, if there was a time to tell people that this would be now, and I think it it would be difficult, but I think it's necessary mm. because if we don't do it now, then everything else becomes possible uh, permissible in future. If you think about it, if we if we say that we okay, it, it's allowed to save people, you know, from uh, bad economic consequences now. Uh, or at the expense of other people, uh, of other citizens. If we accept that principle, well, we still, we'll still have high unemployment after this crisis. Even if we recover from this crisis, we'll still have high unemployment because we were already at 40% unemployment before this crisis. And so why were we not funding those people? That will be the, 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 the response. Mm. And there will be a, an expectation of a bailout for everyone who's unemployed. And so we have to stop that now and say no one gets a bailout. We will just uh, cut taxes so that everyone can, uh, gets the necessary stimulus in the economy. That government is not hanging uh, a sword over your neck as you try to produce, they remove regulations and all of that. Mm. Including PE, by the way, which is which which is uh, which is something that uh, has a real cost that we can't afford right now. Absolutely, and, and you've actually opened up the last section I wanted to talk about in the last sort of seven minutes that we have, guys. Uh, I'm going to give each of you to 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 opine on this, but it, it did seem that there is a that lockdown in this country was guided not necessarily from a public health perspective, but was guided rather by a hardline leftist ideological crusade and, of course, a securocrat uh, project. And we see this, for example, in the mean-spiritedness of some of the things. I mean, BEE, I wanted to raise, actually was a good example, that even at the, the, the height of business people, small mom and pop shops in this country saying, guys, we're struggling. Uh, me included, by the way, I've got a small taxi business that I, I'm, not, I'm not making a single cent right now. Um, but there's four mouths that must be fed. Um, even at the height of a small entrepreneur saying we're struggling, the state then comes out in almost the meanest kind of way and says, no, 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 we will bail you out. Those who, uh, we, we will bail people out 
out of the self-created crisis, but we're going to do so on the basis of race. Um, so the, the hierarchy, of course, that BE creates with black individuals at the top and whites supposedly, not supposedly, but whites are at the bottom. And I think a lot of people took a step back, even supporters of this policy. I mean, we had Farrell Hathaji, um, uh, you know, prominent journalist in this country saying, yeah, maybe this is a bit mean-spirited um, in, in the context of, of this current crisis. But we've been making the point that it's mean-spirited, period. Haven't we, Russell? Yeah, we, we, we certainly have. <clears throat> it's, um, it's one of the worst policies. It's one of the worst hangovers of racialism that we still have in this country. Um, it certainly has passed its sell-by date. If, it was ever, if there was ever a justification for, for race-based redress, I think it's, we were long past that time where it needed to end. Um, it's, it's created untold economic damage already in South Africa. Um, and it continues to do so even during this crisis, as as we use, as we inflict a BEE on on bailout criteria and, and so on. I think the final point for me to make on this um, seat there is just you know we entered a very very complicated and um, unknown global problem or crisis a few weeks ago in the in the coronavirus. Um, we, we had a government that in the best of times, that in good times, in, in times that, that were not um, a, a crisis, uh, couldn't run the country. They made awful decisions about just about everything in this country. Um, how we then expect them to, to perform well in a crisis beyond me. <laughs> it's, it's, such a, it's a triumph of hope over reality. Mm. Um, and and that we would actually think that this that this government suddenly in, in in the midst of a very complicated crisis has improved by a hundredfold and can make all uh, great and amazing decisions. Um, basically, South Africa's susceptibility to this crisis was sowed in the last ten or fifteen years, and, um, and as as this hits, it's it's, it's exposed our uh, poor leadership, poor governance, um, lack of of faith in in freedom and in free societies and in decentralized decision making this is just already there unfortunately in our society and i hope see to, to end on a positive note that we can see that, that this crisis shows ourselves shows us in the mirror in a mirror and as we look into that mirror we see what kind of society we've become and what kind of society we want to move towards to hopefully this crisis shows us that no, absolutely russell before i let you go um I actually did have one more question for both of you lads, uh, as maybe looking forward through the lens of a freedom-loving individual. How then do we rebuild um, top five interventions do you think we need to put in place to get the economy and not only back, but actually growing and absorbing more people, creating that property-owning and prosperous free society? What do we do? Top five interventions from you, Russ? Look, Sile, um from where we are right now, We've got to end the lockdown. Hashtag end the lockdown. <laughs> that is that is the first uh, and most important stimulus that we can that we can do in this in this economy. Second thing is, um, Mpiaki has has uh, already said we we have to cut taxes. Third thing is, and you, well, you could say this is number two, but I'll I'll sneak it into number three. Is we have to reduce um, the government spending so that we balance the budget. So we need lower taxes but even lower spending targets, right? We need to balance the budget on lower taxes. That's critical. Um, we need to deregulate trade and industry substantially. Um, and that's, that's when it comes to tariffs, that, that's when it comes to red tape, that's when it comes to entering industries, licenses, permits, all that kind of thing needs to be taken away. Um, and number five, we need to scrap, it, it's, it's really part of number four, but it's, it's important enough to put it on its own. We need to end race-based economics. We need to end racial criteria uh, for doing business, and that is called BEE. Um, it, is, it is one of the most uh, uh, detrimental policies that we've had uh, in, in South Africa in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. If we did those five things, we would see unimaginably high economic growth, social, uh, you know, much better social cohesion in South Africa, um, and generally, South Africa would be on a much better path. It, it wouldn't be utopia, but we would be on a much better path and a much stronger society for it, I think. 
fully agreed. Um, BIK, I'm going to go to you with the same question. But before I do, um, let, let's chew oh, on this, this yeah. PE issue a, a little bit more, just for a second or so. Um, th- th- there's this weird um, belief, I'll call it a belief, and it comes mostly from this group of people who are called Blavity Blacks, these, these trendy lefty social justice warrior type individuals who, do, who view that through the lens of race. There's this belief by them that, oh, no, 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 BEE is fantastic because look at how it's created this, this, this wonderful crop of a black elite. And you should be lucky, dear poor black person. You can now live through me. You don't have to look at rich white people. You can live through me, the rich black guy who is the tenderpreneur, the, the BEE recipient. Is that not most, the most insidious and really the most disgusting element of BEE, aside from the fact that it's a failed policy? I, I would agree with you, man. And also, look, it it, it harms, and like it, even the racial justification falls away when you consider it. it harms millions of black people as well. Probably harms more black people than white people because what you do, you divert resources from a productive individual because of his skin color, so that person doesn't can't create the jobs he was going to create, and then uh, a lot of black people don't have an income all of a sudden. And so this it's, it's a stupid policy, no matter how you look at it. It's just it, it doesn't make any sense. As, as for your second question, I think Russ has pretty much covered it. I, I endorse his proposal 100%. Mm, perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Lads, let me thank both of you, of course, for joining me on the show. The first of um, the, the current lockdown period, I'm thankfully back online. Uh, a big thank you once again to Russell Lamberti, who is an economist and analyst at uh, ETM Macro Advisors. Did I get that right, Russ? Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Ife. <laughs> Thanks, man, for joining us. And of course, thank you to Mr. Mpiake Igamini, a writer, analyst, and researcher at the Free Market Foundation. Um, big thanks to both of you gentlemen. Guys, how do we find you guys on your social media? I, uh, I, I tweet at, at Russ Lamberti, um, and you can just look out for most of my stuff there. I'll link to, to most things I'm doing. Um, yeah, and then that's that's about it. And my, my business website is uh, www.etmmacro.com, and that's where professional investors can can look me up for for uh, economic uh, macro research and investment advisory services. Uh, yeah, and otherwise on Twitter. And thanks so much for having me, Cecil. It's been lovely. Thanks, Appreciate brother. It. Thank you very much. And uh, Mpiake, my brother, my good old friend. How do we find you on your socials? Uh, on Twitter, it's Turing underscore 91. Unfortunately, I've been banned on Facebook for some reason. What? You can't find me on there. <laughs> yeah. What did you do, Wednesday? <laughs> I, I have no idea. They, haven't, they, they didn't tell me anything. But yeah, I've just been banned. And uh, and uh, on uh, my website is mpiakeldamini.com. I think you'll be able to find all the other contacts from there as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you to my guests once again. And thank you, as I was saying to you, dear listener. And um, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be back, as I was mentioning. Guys, remember, you can support the show um, by becoming a friend of the IRR, as I will link those details and on the descriptor of the sound clip. Um, guys, remember, as you know, during this lockdown, I'll try and put out regular content. We will be doing a live um, show of the Blacks Only every all, every Monday, excuse me, oh, tongue twister, um, live show of Blacks Only every Monday at 6 p.m. And uh, this show, the Big Daddy Liberty Show, will still come out on a Wednesday at lunch. And of course, the Friday show, uh, the podcast, which is also simulcast on uh, Chai FM. Guys, thank you so much for listening. And uh, remember, never trust a commie.